folks! Welcome back! Today we're going to discuss a few topics that were discussed on our monthly Patreon live stream that we had last night. And those topics were the danger of comparisons in this hobby. And I don't just mean comparisons on your collection size or your investment size or your business size, but the comparison of exactly what you're doing compared to what others are doing and what it takes to do what others are doing. Because a lot of people aren't even comparing apples to apples and you don't even really know what you're comparing to. All you're comparing yourself to is the allure of the riches and success, but you're not even comparing what it takes to get those riches and success or what it takes to um, kind of be successful in each facet of the hobby, which we're going to dive into. We're going to talk about the power of saying no to things, not just saying no to an investment, but also like a collection or an opportunity. And then we're also going to discuss staying in your own lane. And for the new people, you know, you may not have had, found your path in the hobby yet. You may not have found your lane, but once you kind of test out enough areas of the market and you do find what you enjoy and what you're successful with, staying in your own lane, because I've come to learn the most successful people in this hobby are mostly not jacks of all trades, right? They're you know knowledgeable in everything in the hobby, and you know they can they can hold their own right in any type of business. But they usually focus on a couple areas of their business or of the market, and they become extremely versed and uh, knowledgeable about it. They dedicate all of their time, energy, and capital to it, and they do it better than most everybody else. And they're very successful with that. And they don't worry about what you know he, she, him, her, it are doing. Um, in all the different areas and how successful they are, they stay you know, in their own lane. And maybe they do some business with each other person and they, they find some synergies and ways they can work together. But at the end of the day, they mostly stay in their own lane. So we're going to talk about that. And um, anyone that's been following the channel a long time, you probably know I've rarely ever, if have, shouted out my Patreon. I just don't do it. I don't try to sell it. There's no secret information out there that you can you know, subscribe to and know all the secrets of the Pokeverse and make millions of dollars. But... If you do want to support the channel, I will shout it out in this video. It's $10 a month, guys. Um, basically, what we do is you get to be in a group of a private Discord with a bunch of like-minded individuals um, who are, you know, more serious collectors, investors, or business owners. Um, and kind of get, you know, resources of all their knowledge in there. Uh, we do have a uh, monthly live chat in the Discord where anyone's welcome to join. We have a monthly Patreon live stream where anyone's welcome to join. Jump on camera, ask any questions, or discuss any topics that you had uh, thought about and everyone who's there can kind of give you you know their uh, knowledge and experiences as well as myself um, and then also I do release a monthly video on there where I break down everything going on in the market the singles the slabs the sealed the grading plays all the other plays out there and I usually release that a little sooner than I would talk about any of those topics on my uh, actual videos on the channel to give everyone kind of a head start because it's not secret information it's just you know putting all that information and compiling it together anyone can do it but not everyone does do it, right? And not everyone takes time to go go find all this stuff and really dive in. And so it just gives everyone like a little leg up type thing. And then, uh, you know, obviously you can email me anytime, but uh, you can pretty much do that anyway. So if you do want to support the channel, it's there. Links in the description, comment section. Appreciate everyone that does support me on the Patreon. Um, but let's start out with talking about the power of saying no first, okay? Because I think it's extremely important. And it's not just the power of saying no to a new product to invest in, right? Because... That is important, right? Uh, people who are maybe in high school, college, just starting their first job, trying to move out of their parents' house, um, you know, trying to get their, their house in order. Maybe you have house expenses, car expenses, medical expenses, you know, whatever else you have going on in your life. And it doesn't make as much sense for you right now to put money into Pokemon. Maybe everything's taken care of in your life and, you know, you have a little bit of side income or side, uh, you know, disposable income. And you want to start putting it in the hobby, but it still feels a little uncomfortable. But then you're on, you know, channels like mine. You see all everything behind me. You're on other channels and you see massive, you know, stacks of cases. You're on other channels. You see all these sales figures. You're on the discords and reddits, which be careful there. And uh, you, you want to get in the game, right? And just being able to say no, you don't need to buy every single product. You don't need to buy every single set. Um, I know I do. I diversify because, you know, again, I'm in a different position now. I can afford to. It, it, it kind of ties into the business I have going, but you don't need to, right? You don't need to buy every collection buy that comes your way. But Alex, I mean, they're offering me 75%. I can make a margin. Yeah. Do you want to? Do you want to do all the work? Do you want to break it down? Do you have the time to break it down? Is the margin you're going to make worth it? Are you going to actually make enough dollars to make it worth your time? Is that even what you want to do in the hobby? Those are the questions you have to ask yourself, right? Not just, you know, oh, I let that collection go. This guy made the money. Great. He did the work. He made the money. That's how it works. Um, 
you know, and then just even saying no to opportunities, right? That's getting more and more difficult for me every single day, right? In the beginning, I said yes to most every legitimate company that wanted to promote on my channel or anyone that wanted to collaborate with me or anything like that. Like, obviously, I said no to the crazy, like, you know, I don't know, crypto, NFT, you know, like scammy type stuff. I wouldn't ever promote anything like that. But like, you know, if a legitimate TCG related company reached out and I vetted them, I'm like, hey, this sounds like a you know legitimate company. I do a promotion for them. But now I'm starting to get a lot more limited on the amount of promotions I do because I don't want the channel to be bogged down with ads. Um, I'm saying I'm being limited on the amount of like collaborations I do, not just because I don't like the people, it's because I just don't have time. I barely have time to keep everything going that I have going and still spending enough time with my wife or friends or family. And so uh, it's just getting harder and harder to kind of uh, say yes to everything. And, um, you know, just saying yes to every deal. It's getting harder and harder, right? Especially as the dollar amounts grow with multiple more zeros on the end and uh, the time it takes to break it down and sell, uh, you know, the risk you're taking on the market moves, um, the capital that you're tying up. And so, uh, you know, I let stuff go all the time that just doesn't make sense for me at that specific moment, at that specific dollar amount um, with the current market conditions. And so understand that the power of saying no can be beneficial to you and don't always see it as you're missing out, right? See it, see it as you are, you know, doing it to, to benefit yourself and, you know, your, I mean, it sounds weird to say it, almost like your emotional state in the hobby and um, keeping yourself, you know, well balanced and, you know, feeling confident about what you're doing and the size of, of what you're doing. And uh, it can, you know, it can actually lead to more success, right? Uh, you know, the, the tortoise always won the race, right? And so, you know, building slowly with your collection, your investment, your business is always, you know, better than trying to say yes to everything, get, get in over your head, both in terms of time and dollar amount, and uh, it can come crashing down. So be careful with that. Power of saying no is great. Staying in your own lane. For the newbies in the hobby, right, it's gonna be harder for you right now because you're still kind of finding your footing. You're finding all this stuff for the first time. You're seeing pack openers. You're seeing, you know, collecting channels. You're seeing investing channels. You're seeing business channels. And you're trying to figure out what you even like. What kind of business do you even like? What, what kind of way do you wanna uh, kind of uh, interact with the hobby, right? Do, are you just an investor? You wanna be a, a strict investor, sealed investor, whatever. You, you wanna be passive. You don't wanna spend a lot of time with it. Are you uh, more, you want, you really want to dedicate time to this? You want to kind of try to make it a side business, maybe even a full-time business at some point. You're trying to find out which business even works for you. And so uh, in the beginning, it's hard, but this kind of goes into the whole comparison thing. Understand, you do not need to compete with every facet of this business. You don't need to compete with everyone in the business. The fact of the matter is life's unfair. Some people were just born lucky and they, they're they wealthy. They were already independently wealthy from their family, right? Some people got in extremely early and they built wealth in this hobby that affords them the ability to make moves that you just aren't going to be able to afford to do. They've uh, built contacts in this industry over the years they've been in, which they're going to do private deals that you just aren't going to be a part of and you're never going to be able to be a part of unless you make it to that level. Um, and uh, there's just going to, there's obviously gatekeepers in the hobby where, when it comes to like distributors, when it comes to platforms like, you know, eBay. Fanatics, when it comes to the fees that some of these platforms are charging the larger sellers because they're giving them discounts because of the amount of sales they do or the amount of products they buy, there, there's all these different you know things in the hobby that are working against you in the beginning. And trying to compare to what those people are doing is impossible because it's not a level playing field. It's never going to be. Life is never going to be a level playing field. And you just have to get over it, suck it up, and try to start forging your own path, right? And so, um, this is really going to be the longest part of this video where I really break down all the different facets that you can be a part of. Okay, so um, stick with me, guys. I'm going to do my best to do this as, as uh, I would say, like um, organized as possible. All right, so let's start out with all the different ways you can interact with this hobby. You can be a sealed investor, right? Or a singles investor where you literally just try to find the best possible entry points on products, maybe dollar cost average in, and um, you hold the products for a certain amount of time. And then in the future, you realize your gains. You do very little work and have put in very little effort in between, right? Maybe you watch some content, watch the market, but you don't really do any buying and selling, right? You can you know, interact with the hobby as a pure collector where you just literally collect the stuff you like. You have disposable income, you, you enjoy the content, you maybe enjoy ripping your own packs and you just, you, you, you're entertained by it and this is where your entertainment dollars go. Maybe that's you, right? You can interact with the hobby as a business. That's where you really go down a rabbit hole of what kind of business. Well, you can open up a card shop, 
and you can have a physical location where people will come in and they'll, they'll trade in their cars to you at low mar at high margins for you. They'll buy stuff, usually over market value because they're paying that like retail, you know, surcharge if you only buy it in person. Um, you know, you'll be able to run events. You'll be able to get, you know, special things from Pokemon and magic and be able to make money that way, right? Um, where you can also kind of, you know, you start doing a bulk operation or you don't have to have a physical location to do this. You can start, you know, selling large amounts of bulk on TCG Player or eBay and uh, really running that business where it's high margin, but it's a lot of volume and it takes a lot of work. You can um, go into the graded side of things where that is a whole other rabbit hole. What cards do you want to grade? Do you want to be a high volume seller, or a low volume, high dollar seller? Um, do you want to agree with PSA or, or Beckett or CGC or TAG or any other grading companies out there? Um, you can, uh, you know, be a sealed sealed uh, seller where you sell sealed English or sealed Japanese where you can get in with distributors or you have different connections out there where you can buy, you know, buy low, sell high type thing. Um, you can be a, you know, kind of consultant or like a high end, like whale middleman where you find, you know, high end collectibles out there for them and you kind of work a deal on their behalf and you make a margin in between or you consult them on what they want to do and they'll charge you a fee or you charge them a fee. There's, there's, there's literally a million ways you can interact with this hobby. So once you find kind of which way you want to go, you know, you can, you can start to dive in how you want to approach it. So again, the most successful people, they pick one or two of these routes and they go that route and they try to be extremely knowledgeable, successful. They dedicate their time, energy and capital to it and they're, and they're good at it. Right. And so let's start out with the card grading route. Okay. Cause this is one I, I know relatively well with the card grading route. You're constantly wanting to keep an eye on the market and see what cards have the highest margins what cards you can make the most dollar amounts off, which are, are different things. We'll talk about that in a second. It's another thing we discussed in the in the Patreon last night. But the difference in margin and dollar amount you're actually making. And then uh, talking about, you know, how much work, again, how much work you're wanting to put in and effort you're wanting to put in to those flips, okay? Because in the reseller world, not, not Pokemon reseller world, in the overall eBay, you know, reseller world, like the, the mainstream resellers, right? A lot of them have this idea of building large inventories and it becomes like the law of large numbers. Once you get 500 items listed, 1,000 items listed, 2,000 items, 10,000 items listed on your eBay or TCG player store, it becomes the law of numbers. Eventually, you know, you just start selling a certain amount of items per day, per week, per month because of how you know large your inventory is because when customers come to your site, they find a whole bunch of other things they like when, you're, when they're already there and that's kind of the, the idea of the business model. Now. The downside to that is you're going to be working in the business, not on the business. You are going to be shipping out orders every single freaking day. You're, a lot of your time is going to be spent, you know, pulling orders, packing orders, shipping orders, dealing with customers, dealing with questions, constantly refilling those inventories, and it becomes a full-time job in and of itself. Okay, so that's one route you can go is the high volume where you're just trying to find anything and everything that you can grade and sell at a margin, right? Or you can take the high dollar, uh, I would say, it's not margin, it's a lower margin actually, but higher, or it could be the similar margin, but a higher dollar return. Whereas, you know, if you're buying a card for $10 and you grade it and it sells for a hundred, that's a massive margin, but you're making 90 bucks. Okay. I mean, you know, shipping and fees, all that, I get it. We're just simple numbers today. Okay. But if you buy a card for 500 and you can sell it for 800, well, you made 300 bucks, even though it was a sm much smaller margin. Okay. Also, you have to sell a lot less of the higher dollar cards to make the same income as someone selling a million of these, you know, bulk cards or like, you know, smaller graded cards, whatever it may be. Also, there's different benefits to going each way, right? Going the large volume route, it allows you to be diversified and that way you're not like dependent on what individual cards are doing on the market as much. You're not dependent on exactly, you know, a specific set or a specific reprint, things like that. Um, you're not as dependent on, you know, making a couple sales because you're making so many sales that it's not really mattering which ones are selling and not selling. And, um, you know, it's, it's a lot easier to just find anything and everything than it is to target specific cards. Um, but, uh, you know, the downside to that is again, you're going to be constantly working it and, um, it's just, you have to continuously do larger and larger volumes to grow. Whereas with the higher dollar, you know, uh, plays, you have a few things. First of all, you get to use the higher grading tiers, right? You can afford to use the higher grading tiers, which allows you to get your cards back extremely fast. So you can make the plays much faster. If you're grading thousand, two thousand, three thousand dollar cards, 
you use the higher grading tiers, it, the, the, the cost of grading doesn't affect your margins as much, you get them back like that, okay? That's one thing. Two, those are the cards that more people are gonna buy. They're actually more liquid than the 40, 50, 60, $100 slabs. It's crazy to hear that, but they are, right? People aren't as likely to buy the, the fifth or 10th hit in the set, even if it's like, you know, some low pop or some, you know, like scarce card, whatever it may be, hard to grade people are more likely to buy just the top hit. Doesn't matter what the population report is, doesn't matter how rare it is, how scarce it is, people are more likely to buy the Charizard, okay? And then Charizard's the, you know, just one card, anything, whatever, insert any popular Pokemon you wanna put in there. The Greninja, right? They're more likely to buy that card. And another benefit you have is if you're selling on eBay, you have authenticity guaranteed, where you send that card to eBay, they authenticate it, and then after it leaves them, you have zero responsibility for it. If it gets lost in the, in, the, in the mail, eBay takes care of it. If the person doesn't like it, eBay takes care of it. Whatever it may be, you're covered. And so you have a lot of benefits to dealing with higher end cards that you don't with the lower end. Also, you don't have to keep as large of inventories, right? You don't have to have as many SKUs to go through. Um, also, you can take it one step further and just go target a specific couple cards to where you don't have to you know, go through and list hundreds of cards in these grading orders, which takes hours of time. You don't have to get the cards back and then take, you know, move the scans over or take new scans of hundreds of different cards and make hundreds of different listings. You just make one or two listings, right? Every time one sells, you just replace it with a new one or you can just put a quantity on there and just make those listings and let them sit. And it takes so much, infinitely less time and you're making sometimes better money, sometimes the same amount of money depending on what's selling, what isn't. And then, you know, you can keep doing those plays again and again and again and again as long as it's working. And then when sales start to slow, you move on to the next, you know, new big high dollar flashy card and, and so on and so forth. Now, I get things like the 151s are, you're like, Alex, it's easy to say that now. It's when it went up so high. No, no. Take, take the last couple months out of it, guys. That card was always like a $320 to $400 card, okay? It was always like $100 to $120 raw. There was always huge margin there, okay? You were gonna be selling it in the eBay authenticity guaranteed, right? The grading fees aren't gonna be as big of a worry with higher dollar cards as they are with lower dollar cards. And um, it's a super popular Pokemon, super liquid, no matter if it's a 9, 10 raw. And so things like that, can make a lot more sense than trying to buy a bunch of five ten dollar cards that you can sell for 40 or 50 even though the margins are better and so um that's something to take into account with that side of the business right and then you get into the bulk side of the business right same type of thing do you want to spend you know a lot of time you know sorting bulk and listing all these things and packing up you know 50 100 200 orders a day and really working in the business or, you know, do you want to try, try and focus on like more like higher dollar things, more like, you know, maybe you make less sales, but the same amount of money type thing. You can go that route, right? Uh, the sealed product route, it's another volume game. There's no other way to do it. The only way, hear me out. The only way to make a substantial amount of money selling sealed product, I don't care if it's English, I don't care if it's Japanese, I don't care which freaking product you think about. You have to do large amounts of volume. And this kind of goes into the behind the curtain, okay? So anyone who has these large reselling businesses of slabs, of bulk, singles, of sealed product, right? It's the Instagramification of society. You see what's in front, you don't see what's in back, right? You, you see, you see the, the, the well-capped hair, you don't see the mullet, right? <laughs> but... Let me, let me let me find a best way to explain this. Everyone wants to put like show the spectacular side of things. People don't like to talk much about the work and effort and hours they put in. And the simple fact of the matter is, some people are just wired different. Some people have different things they enjoy in life, and you're you're not going to be the same uh, cut from the same cloth as everyone else, right? There are people in this business that literally work 60, 70, 80 plus hours a week. That's not an exaggeration they'll tell you the same thing and they truly enjoy it and they will beat you. They will spend countless hours making ads and content and, you know, uh, selling product and making sure their, their product is, they're, they're finding deals and getting cheaper product than you, spending more, taking higher risks, higher dollar risks, and um, constantly doing everything they possibly can just to make more every single month, every single year in their business because that is what they enjoy, right? 
And then you're sitting there thinking, well, I don't want to work that. I just want to kind of make a, a replace my income at my job and do this full time because I like it. Or I just want to make a side income. And you have to decide what you're trying to do in the hobby. Because when you see those successes out there, right, you tell yourself, well, I want to do that. And, you know, they're, they're telling you what, how to do it, right? And they're not lying to you. They're, they're strict telling you how to do it. And so you're, think, you're thinking to yourself, well, I can do that. You can't. You can't unless you're willing to put in what they did, unless you're willing to take on large amounts of financial risk, unless you're willing to put in large amounts of hours to this hobby, unless you're willing to put in tons of time actually studying and learning the hobby and learning the markets and learning all the, the inefficiencies that you can make more efficient and learning you know new ways to do ads or new ways to produce content and, and draw those customers. Like Unless you are going to put forth as much or more effort you're not going to get to those levels. And being real with yourself and understanding that is one of the hardest things to do in this hobby, right? I can look at other businesses, at other content creators, at other investors, and constantly compare myself and feel lesser than, which I do sometimes. We're human, right? You see how, how, how good someone's doing? You're just like, man, I'd love to get there, right? Or you see someone else's investment and you're like, man, I wish I would've got in. I wish I would've went bigger. I wish I would've bought more. I wish I would've held more. You know, you see someone, someone else's, you know, uh, content and you're just like, wow, they are getting crazy amounts of views. Look at their subscriber growth. Like, man, what are they doing? Should I switch up mine and do, do something similar to that? Should I, you know, edit more, whatever it may be. And it, you constantly go through these battles in your head, no matter what you're doing. And I cannot stress enough. Comparisons are the thief of joy because you are never comparing yourself on a level playing field, right? Because whoever you're watching has a different amount of hours spent learning the hobby. They have a different amount of financial backing. They have a different amount of inventory they already have. They have a different amount of years in the hobby that they've built to that. They have a different amount of work ethic than you do. They have a different you know, life set up with their, their bills, their, their expenses, the risks they can take. Do they have kids? Do they not have kids? Are they single? Do they have a wife or a husband? Are they dual income? Or you know, how much money are they making outside of this? There, there's so many different things that make the playing field unlevel. What kind of connections do they have in the hobby? Like I mentioned before, do they have connections to get product cheaper than you? Do they have connections to the hobby? That they can move product, you know, easier than you can. They're not selling it all on, on eBay or TCG player, their own website. They're making private deals. They have, you know, all these different things set up. Um, whatever it may be, right? They, everyone's got different connections, different legs up. And so getting into the hobby when you're new, or if you've been in a while, you're trying to grow, you have to understand these things and not, not get stuck in the comparisons because the comparisons always start here. They start with the visuals. They start with what you see. They start with the sales figures. They start with a giant wall of shelves, right? The issue is they, they never get to the point of behind the curtain, right? And a lot of the times, if you saw what was going on behind the curtain, you saw the kind of lives these people lead, right? You see, you know, the hours and hours of, of listing, the hours and hours of packing, the hours of dealing with customers and dealing with suppliers and, you know, being up all night and, um, you know, just having to forego other things in your life because you're, you're so focused on growing your business, you probably wouldn't be as likely to, uh, want to emulate what they're doing. You wouldn't want to, uh, you know, compare yourselves and want to, uh, kind of, do exactly what they're doing because you're going to tell yourself, well, if that's what it takes to do what they're doing, maybe I don't want to do what they're doing. And I learned that. I learned that very early on in this hobby when I really started to dive in and, and network and, and find out what, what it takes to be successful. I figured out how I wanted to kind of grow my business, how I wanted to kind of, uh, you know, set it up in all different areas because I figured out really early that I don't want to constantly having to be working in the business or constantly having to put in, you know, 50, 60, 70 hours a week. I want to replace, you know, my old income and find a way to do this full time and still enjoy it and then still have enough time to do other things. I enjoy other things in life, other hobbies, enjoy my friends, family, wife, all those good things. And so um, just make the hobby what you want it to be. And you have the power to do that, right? Guys, don't get on the Reddit and the Discord and hear all the idiots on there, you know, saying all this outlandish stuff like, I bought 100 cases of this. I made a million in sales, which, by the way, there are very real people in this hobby that buy hundreds of cases that do millions of sales. Right. But they're not the ones on the Reddit and the Discord saying they are. That's the difference. Some of these people have, you know, public YouTube accounts. Most of them operate behind the scenes. You don't know who they are. And um, 
those are the people that are actually doing those things and actually successful. The idiots on Discord and Reddits and all that, they're either trolling or they're just trying to, you know, hype up the position they actually have. They have a case. They say they have 100, right? They, they have put 1,000 in the hobby. They say they have 100 grand. And then you start thinking that they actually have that much and you want to start chasing it. You want to grow bigger and you feel like you're getting behind. And then you see my videos, see someone else's videos, someone else's videos, and you're just like, everyone's rich in this hobby. Everyone's doing more than me. I need to get in. I'm going to miss out. Oh, look at that. 151 just went to the moon. Oh my gosh, Surging Sparks. Oh, Twilight Masquerade. I'm missing out, guys. Oh, dang it. I got to go deeper in the next set. I got to take out credit card debt. I gotta spend more time in my life. Hey, honey, look, I can't hang out with you. I am gonna stay up all night learning this hobby and it, it can really be all engrossing. And so staying grounded and uh, allowing this hobby to work for you instead of you working for it is gonna be the most beneficial thing for you. So guys, in closing, comparisons of the thief of joy, don't do them. Have an okay relationship with the word no. It will greatly benefit you. You do not need to say yes to everything, every investment, every deal, every opportunity, and stay in your own lane, whatever that lane is. If you're new to the hobby, you're still finding your lane, do that. If you found what you do enjoy and what you don't enjoy, focus on what you do enjoy. You can be successful at it. You do not need to do things you don't enjoy just because you see X, Y, or Z person being successful in it, right? There's people that sell sealed that have nothing to do with singles. There's people that sell singles or bulk that have nothing to do with sealed. There's people that grade cards that have nothing to do with either of them. There's people that just invest in sealed product and let time do its thing and don't do anything else. There's people who just freaking collect and open packs and enjoy the hobby and are happy, right? Because none of us that do all any of other stuff are ever really happy with this stuff. <laughs> so that's all I got to say, guys. Um, Thanks for watching this this long rant. I, I really truly hope it helps you as you're you know discovering this stuff and making decisions. And uh, subscribe to the channel if you're not yet. I'll be back here in a new one soon. I'm out.